Hi everybody, it is your AP Biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are continuing Unit 7 on Natural Selection by getting into Topic 7.10, which is on speciation. And what is speciation? Well, I have it right here defined. It's the process by which one species splits into two or more species. So this is a really, really, really big component when we're talking about evolution. Because as we know, evolution explains both the diversity of life and the unity of life. Why are there so many different kinds of living things? Or in other words, why are there so many different species? Uh, we know that species come from other species, and today that's the process that we're going to be talking about. How does one species arise from another? Okay, We know evolution explains all that, Okay, because so evolution is really the process by which speciation happens. And, uh, and we know evolution explains the unity of life, despite all the diversity and this enormous variety of living things that we see around the world, they all have things in common, okay? Because species come from other species, and that's what we're going to be getting in today, speciation. Um, I have a picture down here that really kind of wraps it up in one nice, neat little bow. It makes it very, very simple. Um, so here's our initial sample of fruit flies. We have one population, and it, let's say we put them in two different containers, uh, the same population, and we split them up in two different containers. One container has a starch medium, and one container has a maltose medium, and they're able to grow and survive off of that, um, that medium, that food that they're able to you know, use to sustain themselves. And as a result, they breed with each other over several generations to produce more fruit flies, okay? And after several generations of natural selection of organisms becoming, or I should say populations becoming more adapted to their environment over time, passing down advantageous genes, um, we get it so that our two populations, they have a preference um, for either the starch or the maltose medium. And even when these two populations are brought back together, if they're ever brought back together, they won't mate with each other. They won't reproduce. They ha now have a mating preference, or as we would call this, this is a prezygotic barrier um, between them. They are what we call reproductively isolated, okay? And that's what makes a species a species. If it can't breed and make new offspring that can also breed with any other population, then those are part of a species. Okay, so uh, what we're going to be looking at today, what I was just, uh, what I was just mentioning, what I, how I just defined a species is through the biological species concept. Now, there are several other ways to define what a species is, but for the purposes of AP Biology, we use what's called the biological species concept. Um, and that defines a species as a group of populations whose members have the potential to interbreed in nature and produce viable, fertile offspring. Okay, those fruit flies that we just looked at on the previous slide, they do not have the potential to interbreed and do not produce viable fertile offspring. Thus, those two fruit flies became different species. Okay, um, that's what a species is. If those maltose fruit flies can breed with each other and the starch fruit flies can breed with each other, those are two separate species of fruit flies under the biological species concept. Okay, we have very, very similar subspecies of salamanders here. And, uh, well, if they can't breed with each other for a wide variety of reasons that they're reproductively isolated, then they are thus different species. Um, so if we're calling a species a group of populations who can breed and produce offspring that are viable, um, speciation, the creation of new species, hinges on reproductive isolation, the existence of biological barriers that impede members of two species from interbreeding and producing viable fertile offspring. Whatever it is, reproductive isolation is something that gets in the way of two organisms and two organisms making viable, fertile offspring. Whatever it is, that's reproductive isolation, okay? So as soon as two populations that maybe once were the same species become reproductively isolated, they are now, by definition of the biological species concept, they are two separate species, Okay, um, there's a few different ways that that can happen. Okay, uh, so this first page uh, is what we're looking at. They're called prezygotic barriers, and I uh, and I mentioned those before. So these are all the different ways that reproductive isolation can occur, and we can put them in two guy two categories: prezygotic barriers and postzygotic barriers. And prezygotic pre means well before zygotic refers to the zygote. 
Okay, so these are barriers that prevent fertilization from happening, from pre preventing the formation of a zygote. Okay, uh, so, so examples of prezygotic barriers include habitat isolation. Maybe two populations live in different habitats now. Maybe they have different breeding times. That's temporal isolation. Maybe they have different mating rituals and they find each other weird now and they won't breed anymore because of that. That happens at birds. Um, that's behavioral isolation, mechanical isolation. You know, if the, if the parts don't work, right? For example, like a, you know, a fern and a fly, those are two different species because they, they cannot possibly reproduce mechanically, right? You get, you catch my drift. Okay, hey, mechanical isolation and finally gametic isolation. Um, if there's some reason that the sperm and egg are incompatible, then they can't form a zygote, and thus that is a prezygotic barrier. Two species are reproductively isolated. Okay, take a look at this example over here. I have it, um, two species of bird. I believe they both exist in the western United States, but there's the eastern meadowlark and the western meadowlark. And look at how similar they are. They're almost exactly the same. This is a male. I actually think they're both males. I'm not really sure. But, uh, well, they couldn't breed for that reason. Um, but they also can't breed with each other, even though they're very, 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 very similar to one, one another, and they clearly share a very recent common ancestor, they can't breed on account of their mating rituals, okay? They develop new mating rituals um, over time, and, be, and they, can't, they can't breed anymore. They can't breed in nature anymore. Thus, that makes them two separate species on account that, you know, they can't they can't breed. They don't have the same mating rituals. They are, they're completely different in that respect. And by definition, by biological species concept, they are two separate species. Okay, the other category of barriers are what we call post-zygotic barriers. Um, things that prevent a zygote from developing into a viable fertile adult, right? So if we go back to that biological species concept, um, two organisms from different populations or from the same population even need to be able to produce viable fertile offspring in order for them to be considered the same species, okay? So uh, check this out. If you breed a lion and a tiger, okay, you got a liger. That's a real thing. Napoleon Dynamite's favorite animal is a real thing, and it is a hybrid. It's an offspring of, I believe, a female tiger and a male lion, or it might be the other way around. Uh, but anyway, if you breed a lion and a tiger, you will get a liger, all right? And that liger will live a eh, healthy-ish life, okay? Um, but here's the thing. This, uh, the offspring of the lion and the tiger may be viable, meaning that it might be able to grow to adulthood and live somewhat of a happy, healthy life, um, but it is not fertile, okay? Ligers are sterile. They are infertile, um, which means that by definition of species, the lion and the tiger are two different species. They cannot produce viable fertile offspring, so they don't meet that, that last criteria um, for them to become a species. So that is an example of a post-zygotic bar uh, barrier, okay? If uh, two organisms from different species, they, 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 they find a way to mate and they get past all those pre-zygotic barriers, um, they find a way to mate, but the hybrid won't grow, it won't develop, Hey, that's hybrid viability. If it's like the liger and it can't reproduce on its own, that's reduced hybrid fertility. And hybrid breakdown means that um, the hybrid is never re even really born, even though the zygotic, uh, the prezygotic barriers have been passed and the zygote is formed, fertilization has occurred, the hybrid still won't grow. Okay? Um, so prezygotic and postzygotic barriers all produce reproductive isolation. And as soon as reproductive isolation happens, you are ending up with two different species. Okay, so reproductive isolation can happen when organism, when populations live in the same place, in the same geographic area, or if they li uh, live in separate geographic areas. Okay, so speciation can take place with, with geographic separation or without geographic separation. And the kind of speciation that occurs with geographic separation, that is called, here, let me move my face so we can write that down. That is called allopatric speciation. Um, gene flow is interrupted when a population is divided into geographically isolated populations. Okay, um, so here's a very, very simplistic diagram. Um, if we have an original population, okay, there's some kind of geographic barrier that splits them up. Plate tectonics is a huge cause of geographic barriers over the, uh, over the millions and millions of years that living things have been a thing. Um, so let's just pretend a geographic barrier splits up the population. 
okay? We have two different, uh, two different environments on either side of the split, and thus natural selection is going to occur differently on either side of this, this split, whatever the geographic barrier is. Thus, some traits are going to be selected for on one side, some traits are going to be selected for on the other side. And what that will eventually produce is gene pools that are different enough from one another that there will be no crossbreeding. There's no crossbreeding between these two populations. There's no production of viable fertile offspring um, over time if these gene pools become different enough thanks to natural selection. Okay, so uh, yeah, the hybrids are selected against. Um, the hybrids are low fitness. If they do end up um, breeding, okay, then that will eventually produce speciation, okay? Produce two individual species. That's called allopatric speciation. And to sum it up here, gene pools are separated, populations evolve separately until a reproductive isolation occurs, okay? If we were to put it in very, very simple terms. And finally, sympatric speciation. It do, we don't always need geographic isolation um, for, for speciation to occur. It can happen in the same geographic area, okay? And that's when sympatric speciation occurs. Um, reproductive isolation can occur due to polyploidy, meaning um, individuals having different numbers of chromosomes. Remember, like aneuploidy or polyploidy, that has to do with chromosomes. Um, and, or natural or sexual, or sexual selection, okay? Uh, so... Just saying, it does not take a geographic barrier um, to produce two different populations with two inter two interbreeding populations um, that are you know reproductively isolated from one another. Okay, um, individuals within the same area can occupy a different niche or niche than the parental generation, meaning that they have a different food source, they have different uh, they do have a different circadian rhythm, they have a different lifestyle, essentially, from the original population. That can eventually also produce two separate species. Okay, so here's our original population. A subpopulation grows within the population, and over time, speciation occurs if the blue and the green population can no longer produce fer fertile, viable offspring. Okay, a couple more points I want to make here. Speciation, the formation of new species, is an example of divergent evolution. Evolution that occurs when adaptation to new habitats results in phenotypic diversification. Okay, so in order to, to, to wrap this up and uh, put, in a, put in a nice bow on it to sum up divergent evolution, it's evolution where organism or species become more different from one another. That's really it. They diverge differently. We talked a little bit about convergent evolution where they become more similar to one another. Divergent evolution is the opposite. Evolution that makes organisms with a recent common ancestor more different from each other over time. Uh, divergent evolution can occur rapidly or slowly, and we're going to look at that in a second here. Um, can, and that can result from a change in lots of genes, or it could even be a few genes. Um, so here's a picture. Here's Pachycetus. It is the uh, common ancestor of cetaceans, so whales and dolphins, as well as hippopotamuses. Hippopotami. Um, but anyway, hippopotami and cetaceans are, have, a, have the most recent common ancestor in comparison to other different types of mammals. Okay, so they're very closely related to one another. Okay, so the evolution of the Pachycetus into all the different types of whales and dolphins that we see today, and as well as a few species of hippopotamus, uh, that is a prime example of divergent evolution. One thing became more different, and it diversified, it diverged over time um, as a result of evolution by natural selection. Okay, so that's a pretty good example of divergent evolution. All right, there's two patterns of divergent evolution that I was mentioning before. Uh, one is called punctuated equilibrium, where long periods of static change occur, or like staticism, static, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't evolve for a long period of time. I don't really know what I was trying to say, but it's static, right? It doesn't change very much. Um, and then it's followed by sudden changes to species, where evolution occurs like that within a few generations, okay? And this, is, this has been seen several times um, as we've been studying evolution. Okay, where all of a sudden we're at equilibrium, right? And the population is almost at Hardy-Weinberg even, and it's not evolving over time. And then bang, a short period of rapid evolution um, can occur. That's called punctuated equilibrium. And we can actually see that lots of different times in the fossil record, okay? We see fossils that are millions of years old and they're all very, very similar to one another and we date them. And, and then all of a sudden, bang, there's a different change in the fossils. There's a very distinct change between the fossils 
that suggests punctuated equilibrium. Um, the opposite of that is what we call gradualism, or it's a small evolutionary changes occur over long periods of time. Gradually, hence the name. Uh, so both of these are evidence in the fossil record, and both of these occur when we're dealing with divergence evolution. Okay? How long it takes for new species to form may vary. It could be millions of years of gradualism, just slight tweaks and changes over time, or it could be over a generation or two, okay, depending on the environmental pressure. Um, that is it for this video. In the next video, we're going to talk about extinction, the opposite of speciation. So let me know if you have any questions. We'll see you next time.